I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians. And while you're turning there, let me just say um, again how appreciative I am of the brothers that I get to serve with. Um, over the past few weeks, you have been able to hear from James and from Derek as they have opened God's Word to us, uh, two wonderful sermons in the Psalms. And uh, I just want to say these brothers, their wives are faithful. They've been faithful in this congregation a lot longer than I've been around. Um, not 100% sure, uh, but James may have been maybe a founding member when the Apostle Paul made his little-known journey to Moreland. Uh, but he's been here a while, and uh, that's so good to have somebody who knows and, and understands the, the life and the history of the church. But and these brothers have been serving so faithfully, and they do so well week in and week out. And you don't get to see as much of that sometimes, uh, because maybe in here they're not as active sometimes, but uh, we are so thankful for them. And I want to say that to you, brothers. I am thankful for you. We finished on the first Sunday of this year our study through the Gospel of Mark. I was looking back. We started that study on July the 2nd of 2022. So it took us about 18 months to get through Mark's gospel, and I hope that was useful to you. I hope there was blessing in that and spending the time working through that gospel, and you were challenged in your faith to, to learn, to grow, to be strengthened, perhaps even maybe to hear and understand the gospel in a new way uh, for the first time and to be able to put your hope in Jesus. But this morning, we're going to begin a new journey through Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. We'll look at 1 Thessalonians beginning today, and we will work through the end of 2 Thessalonians before we're done. And I don't expect this will take us quite as long as our study through Mark's gospel, but uh, we're going to spend our time here and see what the Lord has to teach us. Uh, this morning, the goal really is just kind of lay a foundation for us as we're going to be studying over the next few months in these letters, uh, just to kind of see some of the background, the foundations, historical context, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And when we get to the end, we're going to think about a few, maybe some main themes to kind of put some things in our mind. So hopefully you're there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and uh, when, we, when we sit down in a minute, you may want to go ahead and turn and put your finger somewhere in the neighborhood of Acts chapter 17, because we'll spend some time around there as well. But as we get started, I would invite you to stand as we read the Lord's Word together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I don't want to overwhelm you today, we're going to read verse 1. Can we handle that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather this morning to sing praise, to offer our prayers, to share our lives, and to hear from you. God, your kindness to us is, is evident in, in all areas of our lives. We see it every day. If we don't, we're not paying attention. Your mercy to us is abundant. And the fact that we're here in this moment, in this place, under these circumstances, opening this book that you have given to your people in ages past and you have kept for us to this day so that we can hear from you and learn from your word, and to know your will so that we can obey, so that we can know the blessings of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we can have the hope of eternal life in glory with you. God, what a privilege we have. God, I pray that we would not waste it. Thank you for these people and for this word. I pray that you would guide us as we are gathered here, to your truth, that you by your Holy Spirit would speak these things into our heart, that you would prepare us for our study in this word, and God, that you would work in us even today just to bring us to a greater hope in the gospel and a desire to live for your glory while we wait for your appearing. And God, I pray for those who are gathered in different places in this community and well beyond to the ends of the earth where your gospel goes forth. We pray that your word would accomplish everything you sent it out to do, which you've promised will happen in the salvation of sinners, in the strengthening of believers, in the preparation for those things that are to come. God, help us as we gather here to focus our hearts and our minds to give you the attention that you deserve. And God, would you help your truth to speak clearly this morning? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> 
I want to begin with just a little bit of background for you. And some of you enjoy these kind of things. Some of you may not as much, and that's okay. But I think it's always good that we understand as we go to any passage of Scripture what's kind of going on and what kind of things we're interacting with. So we begin just talking about this city of Thessalonica. Thessalonica was one of the largest and most important cities in the world during the days of the early church. In ancient days, it was known as Thermae, so named for the hot springs that surrounded it. It was in 315 BC that Alexander, during the reign of Alexander the Great, that one of his generals gave the city a new name. He named it for his wife, who was also Alexander the Great's half-sister. And so it took the name Thessalonica. It lay in a region known as Macedonia. Macedonia was divided into four separate republic, uh, republics when the Romans conquered the Greeks in 168 BC. Uh, it served as the capital city of its republic during that time. And when uh, Macedonia was united as one Roman province, Thessalonica became the capital over all of that region. During the first century, the population of this city was around 250,000, and that population was diverse. There was a mixture of, of uh, Greeks, of Romans, of Jews, and many others who would travel into that region for various purposes. It continued for many years to be a very influential and important city and uh, was a part of a lot of historic events, even leading up to the days of the, the World Wars even. And Thessalonica actually still stands as Thessaloniki. It's one of the few uh, cities that we'll find in the scripture, maybe on Paul's journeys, that's still there and uh, in, in a functioning city in this day. And today there are about 400,000 people who live there. Thessalonica held the rare honor of being a free city while under Roman rule. There were few places that were given this honor under the Roman Empire. Uh, this meant that they had a lot of freedoms, a lot of privileges that many others who were subjects of Rome did not. For one thing, they were not considered necessarily to be Roman-occupied territory. Uh, while there was no confusion who it was that ruled the empire, there was very little Roman presence in Thessalonica. There were no outposts of troops. There was no uh, pressure coming in like there were in so many other places. There was no uh, localized Roman government set over them. Instead, they had the opportunity to govern their own affairs. They had their own local government, their own city authorities. They minted their own currency. They were exempt from a lot of the taxes that Rome would levy on all the places that they conquered. And they were able to trade freely as they saw fit. Because of this, Thessalonica was a center of commerce. Uh, they were rich with many natural resources. The, the, the land that surrounded the city was made up of very fertile soil, and there was ample rainfall to make it a very productive place for the raising of crops. The mountains that surrounded the city held prime timber that was used in the construction of homes and boats and things like that, and people would come to trade in timber. There were successful mining operations, and some of those still operating now, uh, collecting gold and silver and copper and iron and lead. Uh, abundant fishing in the rivers and in the sea nearby. And all of this basically made this city very prosperous. And it brought people from all through the world into Thessalonica to try and get a hold of a part of those riches. What is it in our day that draws people to so many major metropolitan areas? It's not, for the most part, because people just really want to live there. It's because there are opportunities there that maybe they think they don't have in other places. Thessalonica was also a religious center. If you look at it on the map, it was located about 50 miles from Mount Olympus. And so during the heyday of the Greek Empire, as you have that place that was the seat of worship for these premier gods of the Greeks, it was a place that was important to that. Any who wanted to, anyone who wanted to go to Mount Olympus would have to pass through Thessalonica to get there, or many of them anyway. So there was a lot of trade in kind of religious artifacts and paraphernalia. There were temples and, and shrines that were set up all over the place. And as they saw the benefit uh, that could come from all of that religious trade, they began to allow others to come in and set up their shrines and their temples as well. And so alongside those that were built for the gods of Greek mythology, there were the gods of the Egyptians, the gods of the Romans, many others that would come in in other ways. And of course, when it came to Rome... In order to protect their status as a free city, the leaders of Thessalonica made it clear that while all of these other gods may be worshipped, Caesar himself must be given preeminence. Thessalonica was centrally located in a way that made it a connecting point to much of the known world. 
During the Roman Empire, the famous Via Ignatia ran directly through the city as its main street. That was a road that connected Europe and Asia. When it was completed, it took a journey that would have taken months and condensed that down to a journey that could be made in about three weeks. And this made Thessalonica, with its uh, proximity to the sea and all those sorts of things, a gateway city to the rest of the world. Now, that's a lot of information. But all of these things are important when we think about how it was that the gospel made its way to Thessalonica and the effect that that would have on the people who heard the gospel, on those who would believe, and on those who would not believe. And it would have an important impact on the way that others would respond to that growing Christian movement there and how God would make Thessalonica a gateway for getting the gospel to the nations. And you need to think about that. There's nothing that God does by accident. And in raising up this place and bringing the gospel to the city, he was preparing for the spread of the gospel and the building of his church. There's a Scottish minister by the name of William Barclay. He said this, he said, it's impossible to overstress the importance of the arrival of Christianity in Thessalonica. If Christianity was settled there, it was bound to spread east along the Ignatian Road until all Asia was conquered and west until it stormed even the city of Rome. The coming of Christianity to Thessalonica was crucial in making it into a world religion. And so you know in these places where people are constantly coming and going, when they have the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel, they're going to take that message. And some of them, whether they believe it or not, but they're going to go, and they're going to tell that story to other people that they encounter, and God used that to take the gospel throughout the nations. William Barclay acknowledges what we know to be true from God's word, that he is working in all of human history to accomplish his plans and his purposes. He causes nations to rise and to fall. He causes cities to be established. He, he causes populations to grow, trade to advance, even roads to be built. All for his purposes, so that his plan for the salvation of the nations can go forth, so that the Great Commission can be fulfilled in preparation for that day that we find laid out before us in the scripture when a great multitude gathers that no one can number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. Understand, brothers and sisters, this is the goal. This is the aim. This is the end of all things. God's gospel going to the nations so that he can get glory from the nations. All of human history, from the very beginning to this day and until the great day when the Lord returns, all of it is building up in preparation for that moment. And that means that you and I, being alive in this moment, living where we live, having the families that we have, having the friends that we have, working at the jobs that we have, any influence that we've been given, all of these things, understand, are under God's control, and he has a purpose for every bit of it. And that's true of us as individuals, and that's true of us as a church. Why has God put New Hope Baptist Church here in Moreland, Kentucky? Why has he built this congregation that contains these families? And why has he provided for us the resources that he has given to us? There may be a lot of ways that this plays out, but ultimately it is for this purpose, for the spread of his gospel and for the glory of his name to our neighborhoods and to the nations. So let us not make light of God's providence. Let us not lose sight of his plan and purpose for all of humanity. But let us give our lives in service to him, be used for his glory in the spread of the gospel, wherever it is that he puts us. God raised up a city, and he would send people to take the gospel to that city. And through that growing church, the nations would hear the good news of the gospel. So Thessalonica is a place well positioned to be a vessel for the spread of the gospel, and God would do that work. And we're going to see some this morning of how that happened. 
And so that brings us to what we've read in the scripture. I know some of these things may seem very simple, but I want us to take a little time just thinking about these few words that we've been given. We're introduced first to those who are writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica. And so who wrote this letter? We know that the primary author of this letter is the Apostle Paul. Uh, His name is the very first word that we find written in this book, and various accounts that are given throughout this book uh, line up so clearly with other events in Paul's life. There's no question that it's the Apostle Paul who has written this letter primarily to this church. So Paul is, is one of, if not probably the most recognized authors of Scripture. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote 13 books of our New Testament Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. All of those coming from Paul by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There are some who believe he also wrote the book of Hebrews. I'll let you all fight about that on your own. But we know something about this man. Before he became Paul the Apostle, he was known as Saul. He was a brutal persecutor of the Lord's church, um, one who went from place to place, looking for followers of what was called the way, in order that he might punish them somehow for their faith. Uh, He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he he took delight in that. Uh, He took great pleasure, and he was empowered with the uh, approval of his fellow Jewish rulers to go out and to try to stamp out any movement that was associated with the name of Jesus. And so um, Jesus is the one that they had murdered, but who was raised from the dead. They wanted to stop those who were speaking and preaching in his name, and he was an instrument to try to bring all of that about. And so we're first introduced to him in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, as Saul of Tarsus. There's an angry mob, you remember, that takes up stones to kill a man named Stephen who has been preaching the gospel. And we're told there in that verse that witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. But we have to understand that Saul was no innocent bystander. He wasn't just the guy who held the coats and didn't really know what was going on. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 tells us then that Saul approved of his execution. That means in his formal official capacity as a persecutor of the church sent out from the leaders in Jerusalem, he approves this execution. And then a few verses later we see him ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. So this man Saul would wage war against the church. That is until the Lord took him captive. He appeared to him on the road to Damascus and he brought him to life. And so after meeting Jesus, there's this radical transformation that happens. Saul of Tarsus, this this, this man is given a new name. He's called Paul and he would become the most famous Christian missionary in all of human history. And so a lot of the book of Acts is focused on his missionary journeys, and much of the New Testament is made up of his teaching as he wrote letters to the churches that he had founded along the way, telling them, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how they ought to live in obedience to God's word. So though he was perhaps the most prominent among his people, we see that Paul gladly laid aside his worldly blessings, uh, those things that came with his status as a Hebrew of Hebrews, as a zealous persecutor of the church. As you read the scripture, you find that he came to count all of those things that he had gained for himself as a rebel against God, as worthless in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. He knew that in Jesus Christ he had a far greater treasure than anything that this world could offer him. And so he was pleased to suffer whatever it may take to take the gospel to all who would hear it. You'll note, though, that Paul's name is not the only one that's mentioned here. There are two other names that are given. We read in that opening address, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So I want to give some some thought to these other men as well. Uh, Silvanus, you will know better as Silas. Uh, If you're looking at the NIV, you see that already. It's written that way. Silas was a Hellenistic Jew. That means that though he was of Hebrew descent, uh, he had adopted the Greek language and culture in many ways. Uh, And scripture tells us he was also a Roman citizen. We learn about that in Philippi after he's abused unjustly. We're first introduced to Silas in Acts chapter 15. uh, After the Jerusalem council drafted a letter to new Gentile believers that was meant to encourage them to continue in the faith, Silas is appointed alongside Barnabas and Judas, 
to take a letter to these Gentile believers to encourage them to continue on in the faith and to give them just a few guidelines that they're being asked by their brothers to honor in that process. He's called in that passage a leading man among the brothers. So he's a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He's well respected. And what we find is that soon after delivering this letter to Antioch, he's recruited by the Apostle Paul to join him on his second missionary journey. And this comes, you may remember, after a sharp disagreement with Barnabas, who had gone with him on his first journey over John Mark. And so Paul takes Silas, and they set out on their travels, and they go a lot of places, but it brings them, in the course of their travels, of course, to Macedonia and to the city of Thessalonica, where the gospel is going to be preached, and a new church is going to be established, and Silas is going to continue to serve by Paul's side during that journey. And eventually we see also that he would serve alongside the apostle Peter, who would call him a faithful brother. So we have Silas, and we also have mention here of Timothy. Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, he was from a town called Lystra. It's likely that he came to faith during Paul's first missionary journey when he visited that city. And what you read about, and you can see that in Acts 14, but what you read in Acts chapter 16 is that when Paul and Silas set out on their second journey, they go to Lystra, and while they're there, they pick up Timothy to join them in their gospel work. So Paul saw in Timothy some unique gifts and abilities, and he wanted him by his side in this work of taking the gospel to the nations. So he brings him in, he invests in his life, he disciples him, he equips him, he empowers him to lead. And so what we see in the New Testament is that Timothy is a loyal companion and a great help to the Apostle Paul in some of his most difficult days, uh, and even was there in the writing of several of these New Testament letters, perhaps even actually writing the words down as Paul helps explain to him what the Lord is saying so we have Paul, primary author of this letter, joined with Silas and Timothy, who are an important part of that process. As you read through this letter, we're going to see certain instances of Paul speaking directly. I, Paul, say this to you, but you're also going to see a lot of we language and our language as they talk about their shared experiences with these young believers in Thessalonica. So we have these men authoring this book, and who's the letter for? Should be pretty obvious by this point. But he's writing to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've already talked some about what that city of Thessalonica was like, and I'm not going to revisit all of that, but I want to look at some of the ways that we see Scripture talks about how the gospel came to them. If you go into the book of Acts and, and look with me there around uh, Acts 16, 17, somewhere in that neighborhood, I want to follow some of this along. When Paul and Silas set out on their journey, they went first to Derbe and then to Lystra, and that's where they got Timothy. And then from there, they make their way throughout that region and the cities that surrounded Lystra and Derbe, and they're, they're encouraging these new Gentile believers with this word from Jerusalem that they're delivering and sharing. And, and those churches continue to grow and prosper, and more people are being added to their numbers daily. But what we find early in chapter 16 is that soon the door for faithful and fruitful ministry begins to shut for Paul and these men. It says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they tried to go other places nearby, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now, we could, we could have a whole conversation about all of that. We, we tend to, as soon as something doesn't go the way that we want it to go, and we don't get to do something that we think God might have us to do, we tend to kind of get all worried and bent out of shape about that, and we begin to wonder, like, what's the devil doing? What's going on? Did I mess this up? Who closed the door? It was God himself. And why did he do it? Because he had another purpose, and he had another plan for them. And so what we see in Acts chapter 16, verse 9, is that one night a vision appeared to Paul, a man from Macedonia, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So what do they do? They make their way immediately to that via Ignatia, that, that road that runs connecting Europe and Asia, and they set out for Macedonia knowing now that God has called them to go and preach the gospel there. And so that, that journey first brings them to Philippi, where they meet Lydia and some other women there by the, the side of the, the river outside the city, and they preach the gospel there. A church is born there. Eventually, they find themselves in jail. 
because of their preaching of the gospel. And they've been severely beaten. And you know that whole thing where they're singing hymns in the night and God sends an earthquake and opens the doors and loosens their bonds, but they stay where they are and they witness to that jailer and to his family who profess faith. And the next morning, we're told that these magistrates who had put them in prison in the first place send the police to release them. And when they realize that these men are Roman citizens, which is important, knowing that they have beaten them without a proper trial, they're afraid. And so they plead with them to leave the city quickly. And that's what they do. And their next stop is Thessalonica. So Acts chapter 17 Beginning in verse 1 says, When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So unlike Philippi, where there was no place like this to go because there wasn't much of a Jewish population in Thessalonica, they found a, a, a good population of Jews, and if you had enough of them, what did you do? You set up a synagogue, and people would go there to worship uh, according to those Jewish traditions, and Paul being well-grounded in, in the history of Judaism and now being a follower of Christ and seeing how Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those promises, what does he do? He goes to a city, he enters the synagogue, and he begins to preach the good news of the gospel. It says in verse 2 that he went in as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, who I proclaim to you, is the Christ. This is the Messiah, the Savior King that you've been waiting for all these years that your scriptures testify Jesus is the one you've been waiting for. And so he goes and he preaches this good news of the gospel and he's pointing them to Christ. And we see that his preaching has an effect. Verse 4 says, Some of them were persuaded. And they joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout, Jews, uh, the devout Greeks and a few of the leading women. So among these, these Jews who they're preaching to in the synagogue on those Sabbath days, and then to others in the community they continue to reach out to, there are some now who hear this message, the gospel, who are moved by the Holy Spirit, who put their trust in Christ, and now they are joining Paul and Silas in this missionary effort in their city. And as always happens. This gets the attention of people who aren't really excited about that. And so we see that the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and they set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason. Oh, why him? It, it would appear that his home has become kind of the center of this new and growing church there in Thessalonica. They go to his home where they know that these followers of Christ are now gathering. They attack his home, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, that's Paul and Silas and Timothy, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now, again, there, there may be a bit of a distortion about what exactly these men are doing. We, we saw in Mark's gospel, one of those accusations is that Jesus is just trying to overthrow Rome. He's saying he's king instead of Caesar, and, and Jesus says, you don't get it. That's not the way my kingdom works. That's not the point here, but that's how they represent it. And they use this against him, and we're told that the people and the authorities of the city were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So... These leaders in the city wanted to keep peace. They wanted to protect their status as a free city under Rome. They didn't want to be found taking part in any rebellion. They're disturbed by the accusations, or, or more likely they're disturbed by what would happen if those accusations made it to the right set of ears in Rome. But they act quickly to quiet the mob, and they put these new believers under a bond of sorts to make sure that they're not going to disrupt the peace in Thessalonica. So persecution begins to break out against the church. And we see then in verse 10 that the brothers in Thessalonica immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. And they went to Berea. And there's a whole just continuation of this missionary journey that happens from there. But one of the things we see is that Paul, even though he had to leave their town, would not forget the believers in Thessalonica. When he was forced to leave Thessalonica, 
to go to Berea. He thought of them when he was forced to leave Berea and go on. He left Silas and Timothy behind to continue working in Macedonia. And it would be a report that Timothy eventually would bring to Paul when he was in Corinth that would move him to write then this letter, this first letter to the church in Thessalonica. So he writes to the church of the Thessalonians, acknowledging then what it is that makes them who they are. They are the church of the Thessalonians by what standard? In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What we see here is that what was true of the Thessalonians is true of any who would rightly bear the name Christian, who would likely call themselves a part of the Lord's church. There's a lot of ways we could go with this, and I don't want to run too many directions, but understand this. We are not the church by virtue of gathering in this building on this day. We are not the church by virtue of somehow being associated with other people who are in this room. We are not the church by virtue of some sort of generic commitment even to a shared set of values or beliefs. We are not the church because we have made certain professions or have gone beneath the water in baptism or because our name is on a list that hangs out here in the bulletin board. Listen, a lot of things, they're good. They're a necessary part, I think, of living out our life as followers of Jesus. But these things alone do not make us the church. We are the church, the ecclesia of God, because we have been called out by God. We've been called out of death and into life, out of darkness and into light, out of condemnation and into mercy, out of sin and into righteousness, out of misery and into gladness, out of lostness and into salvation, salvation that is only possible by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God, by his Spirit, works in us. He awakens us to the hope of salvation. By repentance and faith, we enter into that salvation. And through this redeeming work that's been accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, we who are enemies of God now are brought into his family. We are reconciled to God. And we are united with him then in a bond that cannot be broken. And this is only through that work of salvation that is a work of God in us. We are the church in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to count yourself as God's by any other standard, that's going to fall short. And so I'll say this morning, if you're counting on anything else, if you're trusting anything else, if your hope is in anything else but Jesus Christ and his saving work that reconciles repentant sinners to God and brings them to new life in him, then you cannot call yourself rightly a Christian and you cannot call yourself a part of the Lord's church. Do not fool yourself into believing that because you show up here and you go through the motions and you check off the boxes that automatically somehow everything is going to be well with your soul. If you've not truly turned from your sin, if you have not placed your hope in Christ alone, then you stand, the Bible says, condemned before God. And when you face him in judgment, there is no amount of religion that will save you. No excuse that you can give that's going to suffice in that day. So whatever your best efforts and whatever you may cling to, if it's anything but Christ and Christ alone, then you will hear those words, depart from me. I never knew you. And so I implore you this morning to turn from your sin, to cry out for God for mercy, to place your hope in Jesus Christ alone. He promises that anybody who comes to him, he will not cast out. He will receive you in and bring you into his kingdom. He will claim you as his own. You will be his forever. And then and only then can you be counted among the church of the living God. In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope in him. And we see having addressed this new church, those who are the church of, Thessalon of, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to them simply, grace to you and peace. 
you have the King James Bible, the words are added there, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a familiar kind of greeting that you'll find in a lot of Paul's letters. He says this quite often. He extends this word of hope, this expression of goodwill, a desire for these new believers to have a true and growing knowledge of the grace and peace that come from being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, the gift he chooses to give to those who call upon his name. It is by God's grace that we are saved. As a people who are dead in our trespasses and sin, God gives us life. He empowers us through that work of regeneration to understand the gospel, to respond to the gospel in a way that leads to repentance and faith. Our sins are forgiven. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our final redemption. And then we receive from him daily mercy and kindness that we cannot begin to measure. That is God's grace poured out on us. And God's saving grace given freely to all who come to him by faith, results then in true and enduring peace. Because of God's work of redemption, we are reconciled to him. Those of us who were enemies of God are now counted as as members of his family. The wrath of God that was reserved for us has been poured out on Christ in our stead on the cross. Yes, we can have peace with God. One commentator described it this way, it is the tranquil soul, or tranquil tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God, and content with its earthly lot, whatever sort that is. That's peace that comes from God, peace that goes beyond understanding that no matter what we face, we know that God is faithful, and his gospel is true, and he has redeemed us, and he gives us eternal hope. Grace to you and peace. Now, I know I've taken a good bit of time, but I do want to bring just a couple more things to your attention before we go. The grace of God, the peace of God, can only come to us from knowing God. That that fundamental we have to understand. And as recipients of God's grace and peace in salvation, we know that we have hope. No matter what we face, no matter what this world throws at us, whatever situations we may have to endure, we have hope that lasts. And that's going to be really important to our understanding of these letters that are written to this church of the Thessalonians as we go forward. It's already been pointed to in a couple of ways. There's a common theme that comes up throughout this book, and that is this promise of the Lord's return. In every chapter of 1 Thessalonians, we we deal with, in some form or another, this idea of the Lord's coming. So chapter 1, verse 10, you can see there, we're talking about waiting for his Son from heaven, whom he's raised from the dead, who's coming to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. You look at chapter 2 and verse 19, and so we talk about the Lord's coming and and what we're going to be able to celebrate when that time comes, what's going to bring us joy in the day of the Lord's coming. Chapter 3, verse 13, talks about the day when the Lord will will come with all of his saints. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, we talk about the coming of the Lord. We talk about the resurrection of the dead. If you've ever been to a funeral, you've probably heard this passage, right? Probably numerous times. I'm sure you've heard it plenty, Tony. But this, this hope that we have, even for those who have fallen asleep, Because Christ is coming, and when he comes, they will be raised, and we will be raised with them, and we will go and be with the Lord. And then we have in chapter 5 all of this talk about the the coming day of the Lord and what it's going to look like, and there are some weird things that come up there and these warnings and fears that may arise, and he talks about all of that, but he says ultimately, look, here's what we're looking toward here at the end of chapter 5. We're looking to the coming of the Lord. And we know that it's going to be his faithfulness and not our own that's going to ultimately make us ready for that day. It's not for nothing that I read earlier from Revelation chapter 7 about the gathering of the nations who worship the Lord in glory. It's not for nothing that James read to us from 2 Peter chapter 3 about the promise of the Lord's coming. And these passages affirm for us that there is great hope for every believer 
we know that this life is not all that there is. Salvation is about more than a change of our circumstances in the here and now, but, but we have this promise that is eternal. The Lord Jesus one day is coming for his bride. He will save his church completely and forever. One day, every sorrow and sadness will disappear, and every longing of our heart will be fulfilled when we are with him in glory. And we ought to take tremendous comfort in those promises. That's part of knowing the grace and the peace that come from God. We know that there's a day that's prepared, and the Lord will come. But this is also where a lot of study in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians can go sideways because of these repeated statements that focus on the Lord's coming and talk about the day of the Lord and other things that will go with that. That's what a lot of people will zone in on. Soon it becomes the only thing that they think about in these letters. When I told somebody here a couple of weeks ago, as what, what's coming next? We're going to First and Second Thessalonians. The, the first words I heard were, I can't wait to hear what you say about the man of lawlessness. That's in Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. Now, I, I think it was a playful comment, and I'm not here to, that's not a weird, like, you know, backwards rebuke or something. It's none of that. But, you know, we, we do have a tendency to get distracted by these things, do we not? We, we, we come to the Scripture, and any time that Scripture talks about things to come, those wheels start turning in our heads. And, and, and we can get really caught up in a lot of this. And we think back perhaps to books that we've read or movies that we've seen. And it all seems so fantastic and mysterious and maybe a little bit scary. We don't like the unknown. And so what do we naturally do? We start trying to put all the pieces together, right? And so then you have maps and charts and all these things, and you've turned on your TVs and you've seen them like stretching across the whole building to lay out the timeline of everything. We want to know, we want to know who it is, which nation, which world leader, what's, what's the event here, which weapon of war is that that's being described in this moment. We want to get into all those de details. And before you know it, it, it looks like one of those things that you see on like the serial killer movies, right? Where there's this thing on the wall with all these pictures and notes and there's push pins everywhere and strings going every direction. And we think, hey, we've got we to unravel this mystery. But here's what happens. We're so desperate to understand all these things that God has left a mystery to us that we kind of ignore and overlook the things he's plainly said. And if we do that, I don't think we're handling God's word well. So what did James show us earlier in 2 Peter chapter 3? We certainly ought not to doubt the promise of the Lord's coming. We ought not to think him slow in keeping his promises. He doesn't work within time the way that we do. He's not bound by the same limitations that we are. He knows what he's doing. But we know that his promise is sure. It will come to pass. What Jesus has said will be accomplished. And there's going to be a day of judgment for the Lord's enemies and a day of blessing for all those who know him by faith in his Son. We get caught up in the arguments about how all of that's going to unfold. We spend our time trying to put together that sequence of events and pinpoint a date or whatever else. But what profit is all of that ultimately to us? Instead, what does Peter say? If all of these things are true, if the Lord is coming, if he will judge sin, if he will rescue the righteous, then what kind of people ought we to be? What kind of lives ought we to live? And he talks about holiness and patience and godliness and faithfulness, about preaching the gospel in preparation for that day and then hastening that day whenever it will be. Not allowing ourselves to get carried away by the lawlessness of this world. That's what he says matters. Do you understand why that's significant? God is telling us in his word, not to get swept away trying to figure out everything that's going to happen, these things that he's left a mystery to us, but to focus on who we are and how we're meant to live. Because frankly, who we are and how we live right now 
is going to be a lot more important then than whenever, whether we figured out when then is and what it looked like. And I think the same is true when we study the book of Revelation, which we can, whew, boy, we can go lots of places there, can't we? And I think it's true here in these letters to the Thessalonians. So yes, Paul is going to speak repeatedly of the coming of the Lord and what that's going to mean for us. But his goal, I don't believe at all, is meant to get us to obsess over every point of our eschatology and to try to put all the pieces together, but rather to encourage us to prepare ourselves for his coming. And how will we do that? We're not going to look at all the references. We'll get to those when we get there. Let me just give you, just, this is just a quick list of things that Paul wants us to do then in light of the promise of the Lord's coming. And these are all coming from 1 Thessalonians. Here's a simple one. Believe the gospel. Confess the faith. Trust in Jesus. Endure suffering. The, the, the persecution that would arise, this angry mob that goes to the house of Jason that leads to the apostle and his friends being kicked out of the city, that persecution didn't stop the moment that they left. The church was going to have to endure those things, so endure suffering. Minister faithfully. Paul's going to hold himself up as an example for how the others who minister among them ought to live. Be humble. Be truthful. Stand firm in the faith. Resist temptation. Devote yourselves to holiness. Live a quiet life. Don't be a busybody. Work hard. Maintain a good testimony. Be sober. Be vigilant. Encourage each other. Submit to your leaders. Love your fellow believers. Be patient with everyone. Do good to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from what is evil. Trust God in all things. This is what Paul is saying to this church. Not, better watch out for the man of lawlessness. Figure out who he is. Give him a name and a time frame. We'll talk about that when we get there. I don't make a lot of that. But that's not what we need to zone in on when he says, look, this is how you live. You want to be ready for the Lord's coming? Believe his gospel. Obey his word. Tell the good news. Live a kind of life that's going to please him and give him glory. You want to be found faithful when the Lord returns. So make these things the goal of your life. So I look forward to our study in these letters. I pray that we will be encouraged by our time together, having been united to God by faith in Christ, having been found in him, having received his grace and salvation, and knowing the, the peace that comes from that. I pray that we'll be encouraged by these words just to, to trust him, to find great hope in the promise of his coming, and to be challenged by what's written in these letters then to live in light of his coming. And so I think there's a ton of just good, practical wisdom for good, godly living. And I pray that God uses this to work in us while we wait for that day. Let's pray together and we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that it contains. The hope we have, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Because Christ has been raised, we know that we too will be raised with him. We have hope of eternal life with you in glory where everything is grace and peace. Where there is never suffering or pain or sorrow or hardship. But God, right now we live in this world. We live in this life. We live in this body of flesh. And God, you call us in your word. While we wait for that day, to give you glory in this day. So God, I pray that you would teach us through your word, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would draw us just to faithful, godly living, that we would be encouraged by those things, and that we would encourage others as we hold out the hope of the gospel until you come. So God, be with us as we leave this place. God, be with us in the days ahead as we look to this word and we pray that it will be for your glory. And we know that when it is for your glory, it will be for our good. Thank you for Christ, who brings us into your kingdom through 
his work on the cross. May we have faith in him. Call upon his name. Rejoice in your salvation and live for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.